Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutforth and special guest Lena Norms. Hey! This week we're talking about underies and ovaries, or just just ovaries. I couldn't think of a pun. Okay, but first. We want to thank our patrons because they voted for this episode topic. So thank you to all of our patrons, especially you. Me? No, you're not. Are you a patron still? I am, yeah. One Good. Day, one day a month, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've also got a question for everyone that's here, everyone that's listening and watching. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, get down to the YouTube comments. Head over to YouTube, get down there, answer this question. The question is, do you have polycystic ovary syndrome? Luke? Do you? As far as I know, no. There's still time. We might get you. <laughs> <laughs> I do have fun. What is this, a cult? <laughs> yeah. We'll get you. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> well, fantastic. So polycystic ovary syndrome. We're going to get into what it is today. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. But first off, I guess my first question is, what is polycystic ovary syndrome? Does anyone know? It's a diagnosis you get if you show a couple of symptoms. And it's not necessarily having cysts on your ovaries but it is one of the things that can show that you have it. Does it mean polycyst, like you've got multiple cysts yes. on your ovaries syndrome? Yes, but yep. for some reason you actually don't have to have cysts on your ovaries <laughs> to have them because I don't, well, I, I think Corey's going to tell us. Yeah, no, <laughs> but, do you know what? Like, that's I found actually, that out recently. <laughs> I found that out when I was doing this. I was very surprised. So yeah. that was going to be one of my first, one of my first questions, my next question after that, which is, um, you know, yeah, you don't need, cysts on your ovaries to have polycystic ovary syndrome. It's not a very well-named thing. We'll get into it in more depth, obviously. But first off, it was first described in 1935. It affects roughly 1 in 10 women that I'm aware of, and I can only assume it affects 1 in 10 AFAB people as well. So throughout this, obviously, it's not just women that can get polycystic ovary syndrome because it's not just women who have ovaries and all of the other parts that go along with ovaries usually, right? However... A lot of the cases, I'm going to need to talk about women because that's that's who the studies were on. And <laughs> I can't just assume that all of this data applies to everyone else. I do have some data towards the end that we can talk about. But when I say women, that's not me saying that it's just women that this can affect. It's just that that's the data that I've got. So there we go. We all happy with that? Good work. Mm. Thorough. <laughs> on my part, not on everyone no, else who's studying this. everybody well. else. Incredibly <laughs> in thorough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Bad job, everyone else. We're requesting it. Oh, Putting job. it onto the ether. We would like more data, please. No, exactly. But this is, this is really interesting because the, there had to be specific studies on, you know, how this affected people who are, let's say, gender diverse, right? And we sort of changed over time as to how we understood like this affected, say, trans men, for example. Example. We'll get into that later on in the episode. That's a little teaser for you. But for now, somewhere between 5 to 15% of women, usually cis women, we'll, we'll say 5 to 15% of cis women, we, we know that this sort of affects, uh, affects them, but half of them don't experience symptoms. Actually, over half don't experience any symptoms. So it's, it's kind of underdiagnosed. It's very hard to talk about this and study this because it's just, it's, it's not well diagnosed, it's not well treated, and it's... <sighs> It's, a, it's one of those things where you need to rule out a lot of other things before you can diagnose it, right? Like the entirety of the DSM-5. Basically, yeah. No, and also as well, there, are, there isn't one consistent sort of set of diagnostic criteria for it. There are at least three. Uh, so it's a bit, it's a little bit all over the place. It can affect anyone of any race, but apparently studies have also suggested that there's a higher prevalence in Mexican-Americans um, than non-Hispanic whites and African-Americans. Apparently. I don't know what they that... don't know why. They don't know why. Okay. They don't know why. Well, Just a fun little that's fact. That's another request I'm putting into the science gods. Could we could we find out why? <laughs> exactly, right? It's one of those things where like, ultimately people will say, Oh, this this is this is there is more people that this affects. We don't know why, because we literally cannot study it because we don't know enough about what causes this thing. So uh, I've got a quote here. It says, polycystic ovarian, ov polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, which, by the way, I think should be called PCOS. Makes way more sense. That's what I'm going to be calling it from now on. It's way it easier to say. Suave. Right? Like, <laughs> like PCOS. PCOS. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, PCOS? PCOS is the most common <laughs> hormonal disorder in females of reproductive age. It is characterized by two or more of the following. Irregular, irregular menstrual periods, hyperandrogenism, Androgenism and polycystic ovaries. These are such difficult words to say. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, but I'll explain what all of this means in more depth in a second. Uh, but 
uh, my question was about to be, but so far, have you noticed anything weird about the name PCOS and the symptoms or diagnostic criteria? You've already mentioned this. You don't need cysts. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just go into more depth about what all of that means. Do either of you know what cysts are, specifically in the context of uh, polycystic ovary? ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovary syndrome. They're like hard boily things mm. that grow on your ovaries, but they could also be like bags of um, liquid. I was saying this to you earlier. I think it's interesting when you suffer. Mm. I, I put, I'm going to put suffer like this. I have polycystic ovary syndrome, which means that I researched it to the point where I took, like I drew from it what I wanted to know about my own symptoms, but it's not something I take any interest in because it's not like a fun <laughs> thing to read about if you're also, do you know what I mean? So I feel like I'm, I, I feel under, um, yeah, under researched in some ways, but I know it's like something that grows on you and you can see it in an ultrasound because yeah. I had to have an ultrasound and ultrasounds are the worst thing really? ever. Well, because they make you drink two litres of water and then they make you sit there for 40 minutes so it gets into your bowels and then they just punch on your bowels oh. to, to see it. That's all you need. Oh, I, I <laughs> that's, that. that's what an ultrasound is. Yeah. Well, I had the same thing, except they, they berated me for not having drunk enough water. They were like, oh, did you drink? And I was like, yeah, I drank like I drank a lot before I came. And they're like, it doesn't look like you've had enough to drink. You it out too early. <laughs> but they did, it was a plastic bed. And I was like, why is this bed plastic? And then I realised why when they started bashing down on me. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, people eat themselves. Anyway. We got that. You were saying. <laughs> you were like, That's about urine. Yeah. Well, I didn't so, think they were shit. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, yeah. Like, who knows what comes out? You squeeze someone. You're panicking. <laughs> we poo a baby. All of the bodily fluids. <laughs> Babies aren't bodily All fluids. All of the bodily fluids. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, not everyone with uh, PCOS has uh, cysts in their ovaries, uh, but it's, it's more of a symptom than it is a cause, if you think about it that way. Um, and, you know, so... The way that this works is the ovaries can can become enlarged, and they've got lots. Of, they can have lots of fluid-filled sacs in them. Uh, those are follicles, and your follicle cells. You, you know what follicles are? Like hair cells. Yeah. So what do what do hair follicles do? What? They grow hair. They grow hair. hair. But yeah. you don't have hairy ovaries. It's no, a but trick question. <laughs> it feels like a trick question. <laughs> Unless I'm about to find out that all ovaries are really hairy. No, so what? So uh, follicle cells in your ovaries—they they are the ones pre that produce keratin. No, no, they don't do that there. Oh. Um, they release eggs. My follicles do not release. No, eggs. follicle cells in one's ovaries release eggs. Right. What I'm saying is that follicle here, you can, you can, you see the kind of like link between those two things. To like make stuff and release it. Kind of basically. Like hair. Yeah. Or like influencers. Like influencers. <laughs> <laughs> like the Psy yeah. guys. We're a set of follicles. Yeah, just a set of follicles. <laughs> exactly. <Body> so, <laughs> just fluid filled sacs, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, ovaries uh, become enlarged and contain many fluid filled sacs called follicles. Um, and those are around the eggs, uh, but you don't necessarily have to have cysts if you have PCOS, which we've already mentioned. Um, and, uh, these, these cysts can contribute to hormonal imbalances, but um, they're usually harmless themselves. And also they can come about because of hormonal imbalances. It, it's it's a difficult thing. It's like one thing can start another and then that can make it, that can sort of, um, I guess, trigger it to go into overdrive a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So these cysts can cause more horm hormonal imbalances, but they themselves often are caused by hormonal imbalances. Mm. The, clear, the, the thing to take away from this is that cysts are not the issue, the core issue, right? They are... They are something that stems from the initial, the initial sort of, if you want to call it an issue, right? They, they're what stems from the initial thing that causes uh, PCOS in the first place, right? Um, and essentially, there's just a, a, a big number of harmless follicles that are up to eight millimeters um, uh, in size. So eight millimeters is just under a centimeter, which is perfectly visible. Like that's per that's visible with the naked eye, visible yeah, in you're an ultrasound. Miss that, aren't yeah, you? No, exactly. Um, and so they're basically these undeveloped, uh, underdeveloped sacs in which eggs develop. Um, and in uh, people with uh, PCOS, uh, they can't release an egg usually, uh, which means that ovulation doesn't take place, which is the next thing. So basically, they're they're called cysts, but they're these sort of follicles that are just filled with fluid and they can't release an egg. Yeah. So they're not mm. the same as usual ovarian cysts. So having ovarian cysts doesn't mean that you have polycystic ovary syndrome, but also not having them doesn't mean that you don't have it. Does that make any sense to anyone at all? <laughs> It sounds like a grey area. That's what I'm getting from it. It's like, it's a grey area, depends on the person. It's less of a grey area and more of just an overlapping of terms. Right. In a way, and, and a per name for the syndrome as a whole. Um, so the next thing is irregular periods. And essentially, the ovaries don't regularly ovulate. We now understand why that is. It's because the follicles don't <laughs> regularly release eggs. But there can be other reasons why. There can be other reasons why you don't ovulate. Again, this is one of those things that I mentioned. You need mm. to rule out a bunch of other things before you diagnose. 
wife knows this. It's it's complicated. Okay, yeah. we're talking about we're talking about biology, which in itself is incredibly complex. And then we're also talking about reproductive health because this is to do with the sort of reproductive system, which honestly, most of the time, I just don't want to touch. Like it's it's it feels so much more complicated than other areas of biology. It's just. And it's also a minefield as well, because people people have this conception of how it works in their head of XX and XY uh, leading to two distinct categories where there is no overlap. And it just... It's high school biology, Corey. It's, it's high, high school, school biology. biology. It's high school biology. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, all, of this does, it, look, all of this does make sense. There's just a lot of overlapping stuff here. So yeah, um, what we've covered so far is the ovarian cysts, which are essentially just follicles that aren't releasing um, egg cells. And also we've covered this sort of irregular period. So you don't menstruate um, regularly, which can be caused by a number of things. But in the case of this, it's caused by um, the sort of the ovaries not regularly releasing eggs. There's also um, X androgen and excess is going to be in in quotes here because what does that mean right <laughs> excess androgen um androgen is uh the they're sort of the male sex hormones right um and what this means is that you've got higher than average male sex hormones in your body generally remember we're talking about cis women here or people assigned female at birth so excess is in relation to other people assigned female at birth. Yeah. Yes. They're this is not to cap it for us. Yeah. <laughs> How rude. You got too the much. Cis with assists. <laughs> <laughs> How rude. No limits on my androgen. Exactly. You can have Hands as much. Off my androgen. <laughs> you can have as many androgens as you yeah. want. My androgen, it's my a, choice. A mindset of abundance when it comes to androgen. I'm sorry. So what do you think? What, what are androgens? I've kind of already covered that very, very briefly. But do you know what androgens are? Things that. Luke has more of than me. Generally, like probably, testosterone. Yeah. yeah, so male yeah. sex hormones. Male sex hormones. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what are hormones? Do you know? Oh gosh, are they proteins? No, they're not. Ooh, so, um, no. hormones are chemical messengers in your body, and mm. they organize, coordinate, and control the functions of their cells and tissues. Yeah. So, essentially, in the same way that a neurotransmitter like a messenger, sends a messenger yeah. in your sends a message in your brain. A hormone sends a message somewhere else. That's really so. A hormone doesn't itself actually do something. It is just it's just sending a message. Uh, Messy, maybe different places. Different I don't middle want management. To, it's like what yeah. they tell everyone else what to do, but what they do have do? very little to do themselves. I don't want to say that's okay. the case yeah. because I don't know enough about all hormones okay. to make cool. that statement. Right, <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> but then it's it, then it's different. It's, it's a difficult. That's a difficult question though because it gets yeah, into the line. There isn't. A where line. is the line? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, what does what do like you know like say your neurotransmitters in your brain. Do they actually? What do they do? I guess all I mean is like, um, like we know that glucose isn't just a chemical messenger for a, you got loads of energy. It actually is the energy. Mm. Um, and but I understand that. that but that's it's, a, it's ATP that's, though, isn't it? Am I about to find adenosine out? Adenosine triphosphate? No. No. no? ATP <laughs> is the ATP is the sort of molecule that, that for energy in the body. Right. We break down glucose to get energy, but also ATP is used for energy and. The cells. It's look. I don't remember. I don't exactly. I just found out it's more complicated. It's not high school biology, guys. <laughs> Dude, well, that, that respiration is high school biology. But it's okay. But <laughs> it's more complicated than we thought. Yeah. No. Look, biology is incredibly complex. And whenever you try to say here is a distinct, strict category for biology, uh, it doesn't work. Those rebels. Yeah. Life. Uh, 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 finds a way. Such as polycystic ovary syndrome. <laughs> That was a category that, it turns out, is not a very good category. <laughs> no, exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, as I said, androgens are uh, male sex hormones. They don't just impact sexual health. So people think that, you know, androgens or sex hormones only affect, you know, sex. But they do more things in your body as well. Um, they can play a role in metabolism, um, insulin sensitivity, which will make more sense later. And also it says possibly body composition, which is the sort of distribution and amount of body fat, which makes sense because if you've ever seen say for example a trans person on HRT they their body their body composition just changes change shape it's, it literally they change shape it is wild I love hormones they're very interesting it's crazy that I could just be like here is chemical take chemical you're different now just your body's yeah. changed <laughs> is it weird that I actually because I know a, a lot of st I know some stuff about PCOS mm. and I know the way fat distribution works when I see another woman in public sometimes I can tell if she's got it or not because of the way her body Whoa, fat is distributed. That is so interesting. And then it, I'm often right when I get to know them better and I'm like, ding, 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 like because of the way they put on weight and where they put on weight. That, that makes sense though. That's like pattern record. So I was, I was watching, I was on TikTok the other day because sometimes I spend too much time on TikTok. Anyway, there was, I think a doctor saying, who was neurodivergent saying, 
how do I how do I write down that I've noticed that this person, you know, through pattern, pattern recognition, I've noticed mm-hmm. that this person probably has hypermobility if I haven't tested them for it, right? Like, mm-hmm. because you can, there are sort of markers you can see in someone's face, for example, that would suggest hypermobility, but... Wow. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. right? And if you're if you're very, like, on pattern recognition or you really know what you're looking for, you can usually be like, oh, there's a little bit, mm. there's a little bit of something. It's almost like gaydar in a way as well, right? Where like Sister. Yeah, right? <laughs> there's a way to kind of tell, not tell exactly, but you can pick up vibes generally if someone is queer, not because all queer people are the same, but more because there are sort of cultural, uh, there are shared sort of cultural things in the queer community. So you can usually kind of tell if someone across the room, you're like, maybe they're, uh, maybe they're a little free, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like maybe, like, no, I yeah. mean, it makes sense. It makes total it's a sense. genre rather than a category. Exactly. Like, mm. There's trends. Yeah. There's trends and yeah. you can pick up on that. No, it makes absolute sense. Obviously, this is not, you know, a replacement for actual diagnosis and or just asking, asking someone <laughs> you know yeah you know, actually diagnosing someone is gay it's, it's not oh. the same as that <laughs> so as i said uh, androgens can affect a lot of things bone density as well that's why we see sort of differences generally between cis men and cis women in terms of osteoporosis and all of these different things right <gasps> my nan had osteoporosis yeah so that's a thing yeah so osteoporosis uh generally it you see it a lot in elderly cis women yeah. because of because of the depositing and sort of the, the way that sort of um i guess i think it's calcium is deposited in the bones um and then also removed from the bones it's it's different if you're if you're if you've got if you've got estrogen in your body and then also when you go through menopause that changes again. It's it's quite heavily related to sex hormones actually. So does this mean like being big boned is a thing? I, Heavy bones. I mean, you, some That's people do have denser some people do have denser bones than other people, but I, I don't know how much it actually changes. Things. I'm gonna say it's more likely than I thought it was before we had this conversation. <laughs> Probably, big bones, yeah. A thing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and moving on, uh, the most, uh, and if you think about this, uh, estrogen, right? We've talked about this before on the podcast as well. Estrogen um, is not entirely separate from testosterone because you can actually produce estrogen from testosterone. In fact, it does, you, you do that in your body, which is one of the reasons if you take too much testosterone, you'll start having you start having feminizing effects because if you've got an, an absolute excess of testosterone, it can be converted to estrogen in the body. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Hormones are interesting. Your body likes to recycle and reuse things it's amazing. Uh, so there is also maybe a relationship, probably a relationship between sex drive and these sort of sex hormones, but it's not super clear, apparently. It's not a sort of very distinct, this is absolutely what happens. I mean, again, interesting, if we're just going to talk about studies that pe- people should do, look at trans men and women, because they like, they talk about this online a lot, where they say, oh, my sex drive has changed because of X, Y, Z. You have a bunch of people that you can literally say, okay, well, here are some sex hormones in your body and here are different sex hormones in your body. And it's not unethical to, it's not unethical to do that. So absolutely, like we could, like this, we could, we could learn so many different things if we just thought about the kind of studies that we're, we want to do, right? Yes. Pay attention to the trans people. Is that what you're saying? I think that's what you're saying. Sure, just keep, yeah. Just keep, right there, waiting keep looking at them. <laughs> keep looking at them, pay attention, see what happens to them. Exactly. And I think we should probably move on to the signs and symptoms <laughs> now. So do you know any of the signs and symptoms, Lena? I think I have had them. Have you? Really? <laughs> I think I've had a visit. They're like the Christmas the Christmas ghosts. <laughs> do you Christmas want to run? I think I've been visited by many of the symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> um, excess facial hair and generally a lot of thick body hair. Mm-hmm. Apart from thinning on your head because you get a thing called male pattern boldness which if one in ten women have it is it male pattern boldness <laughs> anyway that's another question um excess x and now i'm just like running you through all of my like just like here are my complaints yeah. um, heavily um in irregular periods and they're usually like more painful when you have them mm-hmm. um problems conceiving which mm-hmm. i haven't had um that sounds like I'm, i have many children <laughs> I'm, like, any problems conceiving. Just I have no children well then you have had problems we have i mean i've been intentionally resi- resisting it yeah. so you've had no problems conceiving because you haven't wanted to yes, therefore that's true. double negative you've I had could loads of problems have had <laughs> <laughs> please continue no babies <laughs> um uh, what else? Oh, um, weight gain, but then also insulin resistance. So you you struggle to lose weight, but you also are pr- permanently pre-diabetic, which is stressful. Mm, yeah. And then what else? Lots Tell of different me things. What else I, I mean, um, plenty of different things. One thing you've you've just mentioned there that I want to jump on from is they've also said that depression and anxiety can be related to to this, but they don't understand why. And I feel like you've just kind of hit on why 
they might be it they might be related. Stressful. Sounds like kind of a stressful mm. deal, right? Sounds like a stressful thing to go through. And also, when I was diagnosed, which when I was fifteen, which is quite early oh, to have really a di- early, yeah. diagnose, um, they put me straight on contraceptive pills, which don't have a lot of research around mental health. So that was definitely there's a, I was on a thing called Dianet, and it really genuinely. F- <laughs> so like I think that's an, it's like it may not be the actual PCOS that causes the mental health problems it's the contraceptives that you're put on but I also felt quite saucy because I had never kissed a boy and they put me on contraceptive pills and I was walking Ooh. back from the pharmacy like feeling like like oh the, the village sauce I could kiss so many boys <laughs> oh my god <laughs> but oh yeah my but god. Like, do you know what I mean no I, I know exactly what you mean I was, so I'm sorry, I'm I was just, just in shock for a moment there that's... but then also can I say something salacious that I can't find loads of scientific backup from but I have read in several books and they've been like and I have anecdotally uh, like heard about so I'd call it a factoid not a fact oh absolutely Um, when you are on contraceptives it does change who you're attracted to because you're more likely to seek out partners with um, sit, like so if you're if you're not on contraceptives and you're like out there being fertile and your body wants to like make a baby you're looking for people with different genetic makeup to you so you can make the strongest baby mm. when you're on contraceptives you're tr- tricking your body into feeling like it's pregnant so you're more likely to be attracted to people with with similar genetic makeup to you because you want to be surrounded by family because That's you're about so to make a baby so anecdotally i was on this pill for like seven years and was engaged to a man that i was very much attracted to came off the pill and broke off the engagement three months later i'm and i that was not placebo because i didn't know about that phenomenon but i have met many people who have <coughs> been on the pill and then have broken up and it happens a lot with marriages because people will stay on the contraceptive and get married come off the until pill they try to, to have their person. oh oh my god that may be like a whole other episode but, but it is it seems to be a trend. Do you know what? Send me everything you see on this, and we'll we'll try and do an because episode of it. Until what? then, um, a B test your your partners. Go ahead, just just I would just do that. Recommend coming off medication before <laughs> making it lawful that you have to. Right, exactly. Because imagine you come off of it when you want to have kids. And, and that's then you when don't you realize that's the thing. There's Facebook groups with loads of stories. I've seen thousands of people talk about that. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's let's do an episode on this in the but, future. Not pause, but just saying, I think that mental health and contraceptives are linked, and it's not oh, yeah. necessarily the PCOS. This is the thing. We've spoken about this before. I think a lot of cases, you know, depression and anxiety can be related to, or you know, have some kind of connection to whatever it is, and the connection is often pretty straightforward, if not. If you, if not, like maybe slightly lateral, right? Mm. You need to, you need to maybe think a little bit laterally to to get to the idea, but then it makes total sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just, it's just kind of getting out of, it's kind of getting out of the, <laughs> the very, the very usual mindset of let's just ignore people who have, um, who are on contraceptive medication. Yeah. Let's just ignore what they're it's saying like about most it. Of the population. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. So, um, yeah, no, you've hit on pretty much all of the symptoms. I mean, if you have signs <laughs> and symptoms, they'll usually become apparent uh, during your late teens or early twenties. So yeah, fifteen is. Mm. Pretty, it's pretty early, and you, you've hit on I think all of them there: um, irregular periods or no periods at all, uh, difficulty getting pregnant, excessive hair growth. It says, which is an interesting way to put it. Usually on the face, chest, back, or buttocks. Uh, weight gain, thinning hair, and hair loss from the head, oily skin, or acne. Um, and also, there's an increased risk of developing um, diabetes, uh, high high cholesterol, um, and heart disease, high blood pressure, um, high I mean high LDL cholesterol, which is the which is the bad cholesterol, sleep apnea, and uh, stroke as well. I mean these ones are all these ones are all generally related to sort of uh, cholesterol, white blood cells. So you know, your cardiovascular health uh, is can be quite related to sort of diabetes as well. And you know if the cholesterol, the, the sort of insulin resistance, those kind of come in to play there. That's what you're seeing there. Um, but yeah, no, interestingly about this is if you look at the signs and symptoms, essentially you, you can understand kind of what's going on here, right? It's it's the androgen levels and the way that it's spoken about, I think is quite interesting. We've already kind of hit on that. The way that it says excess hair growth or male pattern baldness, you can kind of see how our very sort of strict view of sex and gender plays into how this is treated as a medical condition, right? Yeah, because I remember looking into male pattern baldness because I was paranoid about it when I was like 19. And it's the way it works is it's, I, I mean, again, maybe this is not totally accurate. I'm not totally sure. Factoid. But I'm pretty sure it's accurate, which is it's testosterone is converted into a, something called DHT. And then DHT is what causes the um, male pattern baldness. Um, and yeah, that that is in 
both. That's in all people. Testosterone mm-hmm. is in all people and presumably could be converted into DHT in all people. Um, so yeah, it's a very strange. Like obviously, it's, it's more common. It's, it's more, it, yeah, yeah it, it's obviously it is more complex. And it's than the that as male well. sex hormone. Yeah, um, but the male sex hormone is in everyone, and yeah. the female sex hormone is in everyone. Well, you see, you see people, you know, people who have gone through menopause start to have thinning hair, and mm. okay, put it this way, old ladies often have like sort of you can see old ladies with like, sort of mustaches and they're balding and stuff. It's just because they've gone through menopause, they don't have they don't, they don't have, have like they have as much uh, yeah the sort of the yeah. female sex hormones in their body, so they're starting to exhibit more of typical I guess male s- sex characteristics. Yeah. I guess is the is the easiest way to say it. But yeah, no. What's interesting to me here is that these symptoms are essentially they're very much just oh you're you're having you're having secondary sex characteristics that don't align with your gender. Mm. It's it's very very close to I guess, and and this isn't saying that you know anyone that has that has uh, PCOS is trans, but it's very close to, I guess, how gender dysphoria is, you know, if, if going from a completely different angle, right? Mm. In, the, in, the, in all cases, essentially, if you've got this, you probably has, have gender dysphoria in, in the sense that you're, you, let's, let's say you're, you're a cis woman and you don't want to have a mustache, you don't want to have sort of, you know, any other sort of body hair and all that stuff. You're probably, you're, you're basically experiencing gender dysphoria there. Right, and it's just mm. <laughs> it's just based on uh, the sort of chromosomal aspect that we say, okay, this one is okay, and we will give you treatment to um, we'll give you treatment to align with your gender, and this one is not okay because it's super weird and different, and we're gonna make it really, really, really difficult for you to get any treatment for it. Right, like ultimately they're very similar things, but they're treated oh so differently. When I was prescribed things, I've realised in retrospect they could be sorted into two categories: um, pain. And mm. then gender nonconformity. Yeah, <laughs> and they right. were treated as with the same amount of urgency. And I wasn't asked whether it was like, d- d- like, does having a moustache affect your life? They were like, well, obviously, <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> it must do. And yeah. I was immediately assigned electrolysis, like free on the NHS, like straight away. Whereas I've like had trans friends that have had find that really hard to get given. Yes. <laughs> where I was like, I had it for free, and it was, it's also really, really painful. So I, I did it for about a year. But they put hot needles into your skin. They burn the follicle at the bottom, at the back of, and it's all around your. Chin, it's and I've, I have like six tattoos. It's way more painful mm. than a tattoo. And I gave up after a while because I was just really upset afterwards. And I was like, I feel like I'm sending my body the wrong message. That it's like you're wrong. We're gonna stick hot needles into you until you conform. And I was like, I think I'm just gonna wax. And the fact that they just gave, <laughs> they just gave that to you, like yeah, they clearly were like, there you go. because we like. And again, it just shows the sort of gender conformity that's very much present throughout the medical sort of uh, field. And you know what you're saying is that they they give these two things the same sort of the same sort of weight mm. literally i mean i took those i took those symptoms from the nhs and they are putting sort of irregular periods or, or no periods at all which you know is fertility related which can be very very important to people they're putting that up next to things like growing facial hair where we wouldn't expect we wouldn't expect people to grow facial hair you know um you with thinning hair or oily skin and acne it's all being given a similar weight to these different things that go along with it like diabetes like i think being sort of consistently pre-diabetic is maybe more of an issue than facial hair, right? Like yeah. that's, that seems to be more medically relevant to me. And yet they are just, they're sort of placed on mm. on equal footing. And they didn't so- assign me a nutritionist. They just said, you're fat. You're very, very fat. You need to lose some weight. And I'm like, sir, I'm 15. Oh <laughs> Leave my me God. alone. Oh my God. <laughs> Leave me alone. But you know, this was like, I mean, I guess it was like the 2010s, but like, <laughs> like they were literally, he was just like, so what's going on here? Is it you're fat? <laughs> And so I went back into the car and I had a little cry. I feel really bad for my, like, I was 15. That's so bad. But they didn't assign me a nutritionist. What? But they did, like, put but hot needles in put, my skin. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Fix facial hair. Well, that's the yeah. I mean, if you're talking about, if we're, if we're talking about the sort of, like, the weight gain that can come along with it, the reason, I mean, and this is, this is a difficult topic as well, right? Because sort of weight and health have, let's say, a rocky relationship. When it comes to that sort of thing, like, there are studies like losing losing weight can help. Low carb diets can help with the with the other symptoms, right? But also the way that people go about it is just not going to help at all. Like not at all. If anything, you can put someone into an eating disorder or give them depression mm. and all of these things, which is just going to make their health worse, right? Mm. It's just 
basically, this is one of those, this is one of these, this is kind of um, a culmination or not culmination. All of these sort of things are coming together. The way that we treat generally women in society, the way that we treat gender in society, the way that we treat, you know, people who are overweight or people, you know, who have more fat than others in society, right? Like all of these things coming together with this one <laughs> syndrome and it's just like, oh no, we're not. We're not really set up societally to deal with this in the most effective way because we've got too many cultural hang-ups on every element of this syndrome. It's just, it's a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, and it's so many women as well. It's just so many of them. Like literally, like because like from five to twenty percent is the like I've I've found numbers from five to twenty percent. That is a lot of people, and a lot of people to just kind of I guess ig ignore mm. when it comes to the categories. <laughs> that we decide to use. ding -a ling ling is that the ad bell? He's ringing again. Why is he ringing this time, Cory? He's ringing for After Dark Luke. Why have we gendered our ad bell, Cory? Because he's a boy and I want to <laughs> respect him just like I respect After Dark, our sister show to this podcast, Psy Guys. After Dark is what happens after Psy Guys ends. We just chat about whatever we want to chat about. If you've ever been listening to Psy Guys and gone, God, I wish there were less facts, uh, then you can listen to After Dark. I wish there were more opinions in this show. More philosophy uh, and politics. Uh, yes, After Dark is the show where Cory and I sit down, and maybe with a guest sometimes, sit down and discuss just more sort of floaty, woo-woo-y ideas about things we think with our brains. And where can they watch this wonderful, wonderful show, Luke? Well, they can listen to it and watch it at patreon.com forward slash Psy Hi guys, our Patreon, where you can also support us and help us keep doing this thing that you apparently like us doing. Did you say patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys? Yes, I think I did. I think I did say patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys. Well, if you want to listen to After Dark, it seems like you should get to patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys. That's patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys in case you weren't paying attention. Now pay attention because we're about to start the show. Oh, my attention has been paid and will continue to be paid until the end when I go home. <laughs> So let's move on to the causes really quickly. So the exact cause is unknown, but we do know that it runs in families. We've done a lot of genetic studies and I think it's maybe, I think 70%, yeah, 70% heritability. That comes from twin studies and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. So th th there does seem to be a genetic cause to this, but th I think the sort of prevailing idea is that there is a heavy genetic element and then environmental factors can kind of, um, can kind of change that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a genetic predisposition, Environmental factors will then, you know, cause the development and progression of PCOS. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's something that's hard to trace as well, because people like we know the boomers are undiagnosed as a generation. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then and then before that, I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe my, my nan could have had it, but I never met her. Mm. And I, there, there's often maybe a, a long line of women who have lost a lot of pregnancies and they don't know why because nobody ever researched it they were like we're well, just a shit woman why do you keep like can't, why can't you bring a baby to term and it might actually and it might actually be that there, you have a long line of women in your family that had pcos but nobody knew no exactly it's anyway. it's it's like no it's it's i, I love I that you're bringing it up that, but i mean maybe i should you know you can it's your thing you're allowed <laughs> to do thing. it <laughs> no but it makes sense it's like when you look back through history and you're like oh look, that scientist was autistic that scientist was mm. autistic. If any, look, put it this way, if ever you go through a history book and you and you see that someone was eccentric and not terribly, they, they probably just had undiagnosed autism, you know, things like that. Or ADHD, it's like, oh, this person worked like, you know, 20 hours a day and slept for three and could never, could never remember. It. They just had ADHD before we knew what that was, right? We just them characters. Exactly. <laughs> I've been rereading um, Steve Jobs' autobiography by Walter Isaacson. And I was lit, like, having been in, I currently in the process of getting an ADHD diagnosis, most likely, um, I was reading this book and I was like, this guy had loads of ADHD, for sure. I thought you were going to say he was showing high signs of PCOS. No. I was like, I was like Steve. <laughs> yeah, Steve Jobs had had very irregular periods, to be fair. Um, Didn't even but, have one for his whole life. That's the, that's the real thing. That's wow. incredibly cool. irregular. Um, yeah, and, and I was like, this guy's got masses of ADHD, for sure. And then I Googled it, and it was like, yeah, there's loads of theories about wow. Steve Jobs having ADHD. But, then it's, it, but it's so interesting, because even if you look back sort of one generation, right, because ADHD is obviously, you know, it's quite heritable as well. If you have ADHD or autism, one of your parents probably does, or one of their parents probably does, or one of your siblings, your cousins, or something like that probably does too. And yet, so often we find someone being the first person in their family to be diagnosed with it at all. Where does it come from? Well, who knows? I mean, if we look back <laughs> at my family. from the gods. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, looking back at my family, I'm like, 
oh man, you guys were just neurodivergent. You just uh, mm. you just didn't know it. No, yeah, did you? Contributes to when children say like, oh, this is how I'm feeling. The parent can be like, oh, everyone feels like that. I feel like that. <laughs> Your grandfather was like that. <laughs> Nobody can concentrate. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, like contributes being underdiagnosed yeah. because if it's in a family, everyone's like, that's not weird. That's <laughs> just normal. And it's They're not- my personality traits. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about this off pod as well, but you also tend to find yourself being around people that have similar, mm. those sort of similar experiences to you. So neuro- neuro- neurodivergent people will often sort of come together unintentionally. I remember I was living in a house with Luke and, a mul- and multiple other people, and one of us was diagnosed with ADHD. All of us have it, bear in mind. Literally all of us have it. At that point, one of us was diagnosed, and I was saying to myself, I was like, but I'm pretty normal in comparison to this one person. I mean, look at everyone else in the house. Yeah. We're all normal, and this one person is the outlier. Yep. Now, it turns out we all had ADHD. One of them just uh, was less good at hiding it than the rest of us. The amount of people I've been like, I've been friends with for years who have been like, why did I just, like, the moment I met you, we just sort of vibed. <laughs> We're on the same vibe, and now all those people are either ADHD yeah. or seeking an ADHD diagnosis. Yeah. Mm. So funny. And uh, something I've noticed as well, I mean, this is super off topic, so we'll be very brief on it. But something I've noticed as well is if you watch uh, sort of British reality shows like Come Dine with Me, for example, there are weirdos on that sh- on those shows. Most of them, I think, are just neurodivergent, and it's very, very, it's very, very weird and uncomfortable to see them just be sort of made fun of for yeah, being rude weirdos. Yeah. Until you watch an episode where someone's like, "Oh, I am autistic. Oh, I do have Aspergers," or something along those lines. Even though I know Aspergers isn't a thing, don't get me. We'll do an episode on it. When that happens, people treat people completely differently. Even mm. if the person in question, you know, who is either suspectedly neurodivergent or has said I am, even if they're doing exactly the same thing, everyone around them will just treat them completely differently when they know they're neurodivergent. It's mm. it's so interesting how things just go undiagnosed or underdiagnosed and we treat people completely differently mm. based on whether they've got a diagnosis or not. Mm. Anyway, should we maybe get back to the topic for <laughs> to today? Ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the you know the cause we're not really sure what the cause is. I mean, there's uh, there's this sort of hyperandrogenism, um, which it, it doesn't. It's not what it sounds like. Mm. Um, it's androgen, G E N. So we're talking about androgen. So uh, not, not not like not very very in the middle. Very very sort of masculinizing right. male hormones, right? It says here, I'll just read this out. Nearly all causes of PCOS are due to functional ovarian hyperandrogenism. Um, Two thirds of PCOS presentations have uh, typical function functional ovarian hyperandrogenism characterized by dysregulation of androgen secretion with an over-response of 17 hydroxy progesterone to gonadotrophin stimulation. Essentially what this is saying, I know it's a lot of it's a lot it's a lot of jargon there, but essentially what this is saying, the um <laughs> the most two thirds of presentations of uh polycystic ovarian syndrome um have uh have like this specific kind of sort of like an excess of um male hormones, right? Mm. Or of male sex hormones. Um and so like essentially if you're if you're looking at this, it is it is it seems that the hyperandrogenism is kind of the core of it, right? As in the male sex hormones are the, the core of it. I mean, that's kind of what this mm. syndrome is is built around, despite mm. the fact that it's named for <laughs> the, the ovarian cysts that don't always need to be present for it to be diagnosed, right? Mm. So, it, you know, it, we're not coming up with a more apt name now. Although I would encourage <laughs> it in the comments. Oh, absolutely. Please. But it, what what I want you to take away from this is that uh, hy- this hyperandrogenism, again, I've these terms are so based on sort of, I guess, kind of strict ideas of sex and gender, but mm. this sort of hyperandrogenism seems to be the core of this syndrome rather than the, the cysts, which are just a symptom which then, you know, can further affect it. Uh, but let's talk about the sort of diagnosis. So, I mean, if you want to talk about your sort of, if your diagnosis, by all means, go ahead. Hashtag my story. <laughs> like, <laughs> cue the music. Um, well, I was I was diagnosed when I was 15 because I had really irregular, really, really, like, heavy, painful periods. Um, and then they kind of looked at the rest of me and, like, listed off all the things. And I was like, yeah, that's all of my things. And then they sent me for an ultrasound diagnosed me. Um, and, you know, that's the things that they prescribed me were, was the, um, like, the contraceptive to regulate the periods and stop some of the pain, um, the electrolysis, and um, weight loss. That, they're the things that I got diagnosed with. Is oh, that, yeah. Is that, is, that what you, is that what you want to be? You know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was like, is that the, 
that's the whole story. But then, I, so I went through some of that, and I did some of that, and and yeah, it yeah. Wasn't, Look, I mean, that's in, it, it wasn't fun. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> none of it. None mm. of this sounds like a terribly fun thing to go through. I just sort of had a moment of like, oh, so I had a friend growing up who was on contraceptive specifically for something mm. and i didn't really know what but but a part of what she was talking about was it's about her having irregular and very heavy and painful periods mm. would that likely to have been polycystic ovary Pos- syndrome possibly it's right. kind of the thing that i think that doctors just panic and prescribe contraceptives mm. <laughs> because they're not really sure so it could have been mm. but i think also the problem with contraceptive is it does like it, there's lots of other risks and I, I was on mine for like six and a half years and then somebody took my blood pressure and they were like you have the same blood pressure as a pregnant person do you want to maybe not take these pills and i was like oh Oh. Yeah. But like they have a lot of if you read it, don't, just don't read the packet because the packet is just like you could die who knows <laughs> but like at least you'll have regular periods every month <laughs> that'll be fun so yeah it, it could be but I think it's quite common just if, if women struggle with periods mm. when they're younger and it's more painful I think when you're a teenager I feel like I've grown out a bit of it one of my friends could have died literally just from the pill so one friend was had the pill and the other, another friend didn't and she was like oh I'm, I'm you know I'm finding it really difficult with my parents to you know to let me go to the doctor get on the pill all that sort of stuff and so you know good friend being they were saying oh well why don't you try this yeah. and she took it she didn't she didn't actually ingest it she had it and she was like oh, i should probably check this out find out that she could have died had she <gasps> yeah like it would have made her very very it would not have she had something going on with her body but it would not have worked out well for her That's so strong. don't share medication uh, especially not medication related to sex hormones because you don't want to mess up your hormonal balance without at least a doctor paying attention to it, right? Would that have been flagged if she had gone to try and get a contraception? Probably, yeah. 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 It would have done, it would have done. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I say probably, yeah. It would I have don't done. know, it just, uh, uh, yeah, I've never heard of somebody like, I don't know the process of getting contraceptive pills, obviously, but like, um, it feels like such a routine thing to just sort of hand out whenever someone wants it. Yeah. I like, mean, like antidepressants now. No, exactly. <laughs> I don't know the exact situation. All I remember is that we were younger and she said, oh, it could have made me, like, it, I could have died. Mm. Something really bad could have happened. I don't know if that's exactly the case. Don't be worried about going on the pill. Just go speak to your doctor. It'll be fine. But don't go sharing yes. all of these things is what yeah. I'm saying. Uh, but in terms of the diagnosis, as we said, it's underdiagnosed. So there are uh, three different diagnostic criteria. That's not three different criteria for diagnosis. Three different systems for diagnosing this. They're not all the same one. This is why it's difficult to look at this and talk about this and read about this if you don't know very much about it because there are different systems for diagnosing this. I'll quickly go through what they are. So uh, the first one was from the National Institutes of Health in 1990. Uh, the second from the Rotterdam Consensus Conference in 2003. And then the Androgen Ex- Excess and PCOS Society in 2009. So uh, the first one, the National Institute of Health criteria, they require the presence of menstrual abnormalities and either clinical or biochemical hyper androgenism of ovarian origin. Uh, The second, the Rotterdam criteria, require the presence of two out of the three following features once the other causes of hyperandrogenism have been excluded. Um, Amenorrhea, which is uh, irregular periods, um, nowhere irregular periods, Uh, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovary morphology on ultrasound. Um, And the AES, the, the final criteria, um, from the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society. Uh, they, they define PCOS as the presence of clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenism, ovarian d- dysfunction, um, and slash or polycystic ovarian morphology on ultrasound and the exclusion of other, other disorders. That was a lot. What I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down very simply as there were three different systems of, for classification and none of them have like, many ovarian cysts as like a, a key indicator of this. It's the hyperandrogenism, um, specifically sort of from uh, ovarian or ovarian origin, um, or ruling out all other causes of hyperandrogenism, um, and also the sort of um, potential issues with uh, with periods. Those, you generally need to have at least one of those two, and then something else to be diagnosed with it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the, the cysts are not the main thing here, is what I'm saying. Do you think because there's so many different ways to diagnose it and so many different criteria that maybe right now we're talking about this thing called PCOS, but maybe in like 40 years, then we might actually be diagnosing like 10 disorders that will have the same... Do you know what I mean? Like, this yeah. seems like there's a lot of symptoms involved. Yeah. And everyone reacts differently. Maybe, yeah. Because there are different types. There's there's milder types. There's mm. And there could be different genetic markers as well. Look, I, this is the thing when it comes to biology. It's really difficult. It's like it's really yeah. bloody difficult, and I, I literally don't have the answers to some of these questions because I'm like, mm. maybe, yeah. maybe, but then someone who's studying this quite intently could be like, actually, no, we have we have characterized this one specific thing. Right. From what I've read, it seems that we don't know a 
terribly large amount about this. Mm. So it could be different things that have quite similar presentations. Do you know what I mean? Mm. In in short, possibly, possibly <laughs> yes. <laughs> more and funding needed, please. Science, thank you. <laughs> more research needed, exactly, yeah. Um, and it it's obviously, uh, as I've said before, usually you're sort of diagnosed sort of 15 to 20s. It's usual to uh, sort of figure out that you've got it when you're having trouble getting pregnant. But um, usually it starts soon after you're sort of, uh, you start your period, essentially. Mm. So could be as young as 11 or 12, but it could also develop in your 20s or 30s. And yeah, as I've said, I mean, there generally, and this is from the CDC, so if you're in the US, this is probably what's going to happen. Your doctor will check to see if you've got two out of the three following symptoms, the ones that we've already mentioned, the irregular periods, the uh, higher than normal levels of male sex hormones, and uh, multiple small cysts on the ovaries. So if you've got two out of three of those, uh, according to the CDC, you will probably be diagnosed with uh, PCOS so long as there's nothing else that will explain those symptoms better um, and there's a lot more to it than that they will do <laughs> they'll do a lot of different things they'll look through your whole medical history um to see if there are sort of different things that could uh, cause those same symptoms. Uh, they'll look through um, they'll look through your family history as well. They'll do a physical exam, which involves, obviously, uh, as you've mentioned, the ultrasound. Um, it's also measuring waist, blood pressure, body mass index. They'll, they'll calculate that, even though it's not the best thing to look at. Look at our episode on the obesity paradox, but... BMI isn't the best way to, do, to sort of <laughs> look at weight and whatnot. They'll take blood samples um, to check the levels of androgens, cholesterol, and sugar in your blood. Uh, they'll, as I said, do a pelvic um, exam or ultrasound to check your ovaries. Um, and there is no universal definition of PCOS. So, and as I've said, there's different, there's different, different sort of uh, diagnostic criteria. So, essentially, they all will just be looking for those three things that we've mentioned but there's no strict definition of exactly what it is. So it's it's just a, it's a very difficult thing to diagnose and talk about. What causes the frankly ridiculous situation of having a name that's thoroughly inappropriate for something and then never changed and not changing for ages? It's difficult to change the name of a thing that people have written lots of papers about. But <laughs> well Control, but fine. It's, di it's difficult. Yeah, <laughs> control F the entire internet. Yeah. Can you control? You can't control F like a like a like a printed written document. No, I understand I mean, that, but you mm. could you could print all future documents as a better name previously PCOS for fifty years. Yes, yeah. I mean it, that. May, and I'm sure they do that. No, no, but, probably. Yeah. I mean, multiple personalities became DID, and that that can change. But I mean, I don't really know why. Mm. It's because some things some things aren't very well described. So ADD. You know, ADD slash ADHD became just ADHD with three different kind of types of it, right? And the way they think these things happen, I don't think there's any one strict way for it to happen because there are so many people involved in this, and it kind of comes down to general consensus as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the, maybe there are conferences where these things are discussed and whatnot, but like, it's it's not that there's a central, it's not that there's one singular central body that's just saying. This is what we're calling everything, right? Like, <laughs> there that would are... be great if they did that. <laughs> It'd be Just, like, The Namers Ministry, the Ministry of Naming. Cool. It would be really Have great. Have you read any George Orwell? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> no, the no Ministry, ministry of Names. Let's avoid ministries <laughs> no, exactly. as a genre. It would be great in concept, but it's also so it's so bloody difficult. And if you think about it, the name shouldn't really matter all that much, but it also completely does because if you don't study this, then the name is what. Yeah, at least it's not called like something that a person who's not medically trained can like go, I can't have that because I haven't got freckly boils. I can't possibly have freckly boil syndrome, but freckly boil syndrome actually doesn't require freckly boils. Yeah. But because of the lack of freckly boils, you don't die because you can't check your own ovaries for cysts. <laughs> so you will probably ha ask your doctor anyway. Maybe it's not the most urgent thing to be renamed because I feel like it doesn't really carry the same social state. Like having the hair does, yeah. but like saying you've got cysts on your ovaries, nobody's ever been like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fair, like multiple I, personality When you described cysts, I did thing. actually go, ooh, ugh. weird. <laughs> <laughs> Little fluid filled bag. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. It's also <laughs> mostly called PCOS, you know, or it should be called PCOS. PCOS. I think we should we should mm. bring that in. PCOS, it sounds way better. Mm. But it's usually called that. It's abbreviated. So, uh, you know, most people when reading it wouldn't necessarily know specifically mm. what it stands for. But um, yeah, let's let's move on a little bit to the treatment. So you've already spoken a little bit about the treatment. Mm. A lot of it is just gender affirmational 
stuff, just getting rid of excess body hair or body hair that's deemed to be excess, you know, things like that. Taking the pill, um, as in birth control pills, they're often used as well. Um, and the thing is that there is sort of medical precedent, precedent to some of this beyond just, um, you know, gender affirmational stuff, because as I've said, this can be quite linked to diabetes and um, sort of insulin resistance and or glucose sensitivity. So, you know, treating this in some ways can help with that, which can help overall health. So it's not, I'm not saying that all treatments are just, hey, you are non you don't conform. Let's make you conform better, right? It's, there are, there are genuine things behind this as well. I mean, do you know anything else about more specifics about the about the treatment or should we just to dive on in? Um well yeah, I know I know that like I, the the prescribing of weight loss is a very very complicated thing, but it is also linked to fertility. So I have mm -hmm. met a lot of women that have struggled to um conceive and then have lost weight and have become pregnant mm -hmm. with baby. Yeah. Um so I think some of some of it's interesting in a feminist space because you know when I think there's a lot of like uh, talk in the body positivity movement and some some of the off branches of that that aren't really like serving the actual cause <coughs> will talk will talk about how um like you know you should you shouldn't go on a diet you shouldn't and and for me I'm like I have followed things that you some might people might say are a diet because I've planned what I'm going to eat and then eat it. Whoa. <laughs> but like gym bros do that. No 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 oh, <laughs> Other sorry. people do that. Everybody does that. No, no. Don't be silly, right? When a, when a lady does it, that's a diet and that's bad. Yeah. When a gym bro does it, that's cutting and that's good. You know, and look, it's not only good, it's sick. <laughs> <laughs> and look, look, when I don't eat all day and I only eat in the evening, that's not because I've got you know poor relationship with the food. Yeah. That's because I'm doing intermittent fasting. Mm. Okay. Mm. Part of my brand. Yeah. It's just you name boy things a good way, and you think about mm. them being good. And yeah. when ladies do it, it's bad. I've been sucked into diet culture because so I'm an <laughs> idiot. <laughs> so yeah, I think there's a lot of like con con controversial stuff around nutrition. Mm. And there's also a lot of like conflicting information about what you should eat if you have PCOS. So I don't follow any of it very strictly because they could all be wrong. So oh, exactly. like pebble dashing but also when it comes to that. Find out what works for you. you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just work through and mm. find something that works for you. That uh, And that's what I think body positivity is about mm. and I, I was going to say should be about but it's really what it is about and there's just some people who don't understand that mm. and that's something that it really bloody winds me up whenever mm. I see it you know people saying you know making these sort of very sweeping statements saying this is entirely bad but actually mm. um, when it comes to body positivity uh, shut up <laughs> uh, and let people love their bodies and live their lives the way they want that is healthy for them <laughs> I think as, as well like some, some of the um some of the people that make that, that kind of information without having anything apart from an experience with um, anorexia or like a restrictive eating disorder boy. Will, be, will be very like, eat the donut, eat the cake. And I'm like, but if I'm pre-diabetic, I don't think that is loving my body. I think that might actually kill me. So it's it's a thing of like, I think this, they're coming from a good place of feeling like they have an experience of mm. something that's actually more spherical than it is like... Yeah. I've experienced it, therefore I'm I find... going to tell you about it. Yeah, no, I, this is so interesting because mm. I find that very often people will, you know, go to therapy or get treatment for something and they'll come away from it thinking this is a universal experience. And like, I, I think mm. I've mentioned this briefly on the podcast before that, yeah, people give advice that they that they get in ED recovery and think, oh, this is how everyone should treat food. And I'm like, no, no, I don't have a problem with counting calories because I, 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 I count calories mm. because otherwise I'll... Because otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'm, I might be ill. Like, yeah. I, like this is this is healthier for me mm. and better for me to do it this way. Yeah, and I'll feel better. Like, mm. you know, what I mean, just because it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for everyone. And yes, obviously, counting calories has been linked to uh, mental health issues in you know, a number of people, but that's not a universal thing. And so, saying it's bad outright mm. is not great. Again, all these all these caveats, caveats. I need to mention. Mm. This whole UK government thing of rolling out uh, calories counts on menus or that any other nutritional information isn't great either. All I'm saying is that a sweeping statement about, you know, approach it, how, how to approach food or how to do this or that, mm. it's, it's a sweeping statement. It's mm. not, you can't have an absolute that is correct for literally every human. Yeah, and it's really interesting with B BMI as well, because obviously that was, I wouldn't say obviously, if you've watched those other episodes, I'm Ooh. sure you already know, <laughs> and that it was only, like that that study was only conducted on white men. Mm. So how, to, to for a doctor to turn around and tell a woman, especially a woman of colour, that their BMI is wrong, <laughs> 
it's, yeah. it's wacky. Oh, it's wild. Um, and the same with body hair. I think body hair is also like has a has a racial element to it. There's lots of like so it's again to say you've got excessive body hair for a woman. Yeah. It's like very um, for like, a dainty little afraid. white woman maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean that's I mean speaking of the sort of race elements of that as well, it's so interesting because I mean I see that the body positivity mo- movement has. It's kind of not been infiltrated, but some people are taking the body positivity movement and pulling it away from generally what it is. I mean, I've been told that um, I can't be a part of the body positivity movement because I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not a certain weight. But mm. hold on, but the body positivity women movement is for people of color, women, um, and uh, fat people, and a bunch of a bunch of other things. And I'm like, I, I fall into, I fall into <laughs> one of those cat. You can't exclude me just because. <laughs> ding a ling ling is that the ad bell? Hark the ad bell, he does sing. He sings for Patreon, <laughs> I think. <laughs> if you head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash sci guys, you can get a whole host of cool things. What can they get, Luke? Oh, blooming neck. They can get so many things. There's bonus episodes. You can request topics for episodes. There's an entire other show called After Dark where we discuss sort of philosophical things and just general discussion, the kind of stuff that you imagine we talk after, about after we've finished recording. Well, that is when we do it, so that is what we do. Um, and lots of other stuff. What else is there? You get your name at the end of every single Sci Guys episode. You can also vote on topics. You get to choose what we do. And at the end of the episode that's voted on by our patrons, if it's your first month being a patron, you get thanked by name. By us, the Psy Guys. Isn't that fun? That is really fun. I'll use my vocal cords to say your name with a 50% probability because Corey says half of them. That's very true. So <laughs> head to our Patreon <laughs> at patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys. Basically, just to run through quickly the treatment, you've got the sort of lifestyle modification to sort of, uh, I guess, deal with the certain issues of, you know, the differences in weight and how that can affect fertility and the sort of insulin resistance and whatnot. Uh, There's hormonal contraceptives. So um, generally it's estrogen along with, gosh, uh, progesterone. Um, And I won't get into the exact science of how how this works, but effectively that can kind of curb the the excess production of androgens. Um, So there would be birth control pills as well. Metformin, do you know what metformin is? No. So that is used, uh, I think, generally for sort of diabetes, mellitus, uh, type 2, uh, type 2 diabetes, essentially, or um, I, I guess uh, glucose, uh, sort of glucose sensitivity. Um, and it, it can it can help improve menstrual cycles. Um, it can uh, help, it can change uh, the waist to hip ratio, which is another way of measuring um, like sort of body composition and, and, and weight and health in that area i don't want to get too weird it's so weird uh yeah like it's it's basically if you're if you're listening to this and you're thinking oh we're trying to avoid saying that you know um being obese can be really can be bad for your health it's it's a bit more complex than that Mm. and it's very easy to use studies that have looked into this sort of thing to say fat people bad which Mm. just it's look it's a minefield we've got an episode kind of on it go and watch that instead Mm. Can then come back and watch this. Hip to waist ratio. Thi- w- w- hip to waist ratio. <laughs> ratio. The hip to waist ratio thing is really weird as well because just depends where you keep your organs. Like some yeah. people just naturally have small waists and they could have PCOS and you wouldn't know because they're. D- <laughs> exactly, and this is the thing that is really difficult to study humans because like you've got to use categories to diagnose stuff and to figure out oh how's the best way to treat you. But also some people just don't fit into mm. just don't fit into the boxes that we've got that are sort of pre-assigned. Um, yeah, so you know obviously uh, sort of uh, trying to treat this sort of uh, pre-diabetes or the uh, potential diabetes there. Um, infertility treatment uh, can also help. And actually, you know, um, we've, we've spoken sort of infertility here, but most people who get treatment for uh, PCOS end up being able to conceive. So, you know, it's not like you are automatically infertile. You, in all likelihood, will be able to conceive. Um, there's also treatment for the hyperandrogenism, which is just, it's just gender affirming care. It's That's all it is. It, it is literally the same treatments that are given um, generally to trans women, except trans women have to wait a long time or pay a lot of money for it, or both. Uh, so not to say that cis, cis women not to do this if they've got PCOS, but there are mm. obvious differences in how 
those things are made accessible to those different groups. Um, and you can also have something called laparoscopic ovarian drilling um, if fertility medicines are are not uh, are not enough. Essentially, drilling. Yeah, I look. Like it's an oil. What? Yes. <laughs> it uses a laser or heat to destroy tissues in the ovaries um, that are producing androgens. So they just burn it. If all else fails, fucking burn that thing. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but that is kind of all that we've got on polycystic ovarian syndrome today. I kind of want to end this episode with maybe a little bit of discussion, um, tying together some of the things we've been speaking about throughout this, about the sort of elements of sex and gender and how that relates to this. Because I've seen some people say that people with polycystic ovarian syndrome could conceivably be described as intersex in some cases. And while I don't necessarily agree with that statement outright, I understand where it's coming from and it does make a good degree of sense. So do you know what intersex means? Do you know the sort of general definition for intersex? I don't know the technical de definition there. But oh. It's just that you, you don't fall into some of the old prescribed categories of biologically male or female and that can to do with your genitalia when you're born but it can also be to do with other things yeah i mean yeah yeah i mean the un says intersex people are born with sex characteristics including genitals gonads and chromosome patterns that do not fit typical binary no uh, notions of male or female bodies right so it can be just your chromosomes as well it doesn't have to be oh, yeah. your genitalia like you could just oh, yeah, be yeah, born just chromosome. with like yeah different chromosomes oh, that, absolutely yeah yeah so these so chromos loads of people can be intersex and they wouldn't know oh loads of people are intersex and they don't know yeah like, honestly a ton of people are intersex and they don't know a lot of people only find out they're <laughs> you're like mm. there's an episode of house about this yeah which i've only seen that episode of house because it was on in this house <laughs> yeah uh the other day when i was here Meta. uh yeah it was about a, a lady who had testicles and she didn't know mm. uh and she so was undescended yeah, yeah. 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 So there can be a ton of different sort of chromosomal makeups. Uh, you can have androgen insensitivity syndrome, which would mean you'd have sort of XY chromosomes and the SRY gene producing androgens, but your body just doesn't doesn't sort of, I guess, interact with them, react to them this, the, the sort of way that it normally would, meaning that you don't have typical male sex development, right? Uh, there's so many, there's so, so many different intersex conditions. There's so many different uh, routes to being classed as intersex. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into all of them, but that's the sort of UN definition of intersex, that being born with sex characteristics um, that don't fit the typical male-female binary. But the UK government defines sex as uh, referring to the biological aspects of an individual as determined by their anatomy, which is produced by their chromosomes, hormones, and their interactions generally male or female, something that is assigned at birth. But very loosely, sex is generally sort of described as being these biological markers, right? Um, you know, chromosomes, uh, secondary sex character characteristics, primary sex characteristics, characteristics, and sort of hormone balances. And all of these come into, you know, the sort of idea of what sex is. And when these things don't align, that's when you can get, kind of be classed as intersex. Generally, it's chromosomal or anatomical. So that would be just the primary and secondary sex characteristics. Primary sex characteristics being sort of your, you know, your sex organs. Secondary being the ones generally that come about during puberty. So that'd be breasts, facial hair, all of that stuff, right? So you can understand here why people would say, okay, PCOS could be loosely described as an intersex condition because you are... <laughs> Like because of a this sort of natural way that your body is sort of uh, producing hormones, mm. you know whether it whether it's sort of atypical or not. Because of the natural way your body's producing hormones, you are you're you are sort of um, you're sort of exhibiting uh, I guess non typical secondary sex characteristics, right? Mm. Which is quite interesting because it, it affects so many people, yeah. right? And it's also um, some of it. I'm like, I feel like I was prescribed things that actually should have just been prescribed to society. I was like, do you want to like talk right. to them? Don't talk to me. I, yeah. I don't want. And I think the thing of like, okay, maybe it could be an intersex condition, but then is the prerequisite of somebody being fertile part of them being like a, a woman? Right. No. And like, is it like they're not that hairy? Like, how hairy am I allowed to be? <laughs> without do you know what i mean no, no, yeah, so exactly. some of it i'm like oh yeah maybe it's intersex but then i'm like maybe it's how we perceive women to be like hairless and fertile and and sh slippery and shiny this is the thing this is this is kind <laughs> of my how point I would describe myself this is this is very much my point that mm. like when you when you look at this and you take it you take it as a whole the idea of sex being a strict binary or a you know a, a binary with the other option of being intersex which we'll usually just ignore it just it kind of breaks down, right? Because it's quite clear that it's just a case of if you change some hormones that are already naturally produced in the body, you ch ch change the levels of them, mm. you will have you you have sort of different outcomes, and it's not it's not that strict binary that 
we're kind of taught throughout our entire lives. I don't know, I just find it kind of interesting the way that, again, sort of uh, the binary of sort of sex that we've got influences how this is treated and how it's viewed. I mean, like you're saying there, a lot of these treatments could just be a case of Hey, society, maybe mm -hmm. don't make people who, you know, have more hair than you'd expect them to have, don't treat them badly. And maybe don't make fun of them for it. Maybe don't make them feel like they shouldn't have that. Because, like, why not? There was you a know? boy at my school who called me pistachio because I had a moustache. <laughs> that is Which devastating. Which is so funny now, but, like, at the time, I was like, I'm never going to be loved because I have a moustache. But where did the pee then, come from? So it's undetectable by, by teachers. Mm. Oh. So, <laughs> so it's not like... like... He was calling me moustachio. Right. But he was... But, yeah. But it's interesting because now, like, I, I'm still, like, insecure about the hair thing, but, like, my boyfriend Craig was just like why are you weird about this and now we like shave together in the nice. morning so like, put on our little like thing oh, and like do the great. thing but then I, I realised the only time that I've ever seen that in films was like at the, the beginning of Shrek 2 and like Fiona is literally an ogre <laughs> the only woman I've ever seen with hair on their face in media is Fiona in her ogre form well I make God. films so I'll do some PCOS Bid, representation bitch, bitch sometime women, please but yeah it's interesting and it's also like not I kind of don't think I don't walk around the world being like I'm a woman with PCOS mm -hmm. like it's not like the worst thing of all of like the mm. ailments that all of my friendship group have I said that I, I feel like I've like won the jackpot <laughs> you know what I mean I'm like whoa <laughs> There are worse things, so I think it's something that like hasn't really affected my life past teenage years, really, because I'm not, I don't know, because I've learned to handle it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing about the intersex thing about you saying like some people say that this should be because ultimately that is you know like you say you've got to create categories in order to diagnose, in order to train, in order to roll systems out, but intersex is another category, right? It's like you had you had male female and you were like these categories don't fit everyone, so you create another category in the middle that's like, we'll put all, all these people who don't fit in these two in this one. And then, but ultimately that's still a spectrum. There are people who will lie, like, lie right on the boundary between male and sex. And you may say that like people with PCOS, the argument could be that right now in the categories uh, of those those sexes plus intersex, um, maybe PCOS are like, on that boundary between female and intersex, if that's the argument they're making, and they're sort of widening the box of the intersex box. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that's still all categorical thinking, right? Yeah. Um, which is like, categories are great for ruling out systems and training people, but then you have to then train them, as we do talk all the time about where you get to like the next year of biology, and then they go, everything you learned last year was not true. Um, it was helpful, truth is, yeah. but it is what the truth <laughs> is, and then they do that again and go, oh, that wasn't true. Like. I, I talk about this all the time about how I, I wish we could, even just for like two days out of the 250 a year that you're in school, um, you could do all your categories and then you could also be taught like, but also these categories aren't real things. They are helpful. Like they're, they're, they're helpful. Like, yeah. and I mean, like we don't get that at all. I had to figure that out when I was like 25. That was like, oh my God, <laughs> they're not real things. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, Especially studying why science. Why no one tell me that? Why well, didn't? Yeah. And I said this to a guy who does like a lot of education stuff. He's like, if you did that, you'd have to overhaul the entire education system. I was like, because oh, like the children would revolt. Well, good, and we should. <laughs> like, but I was like, but if it's not true, yeah. then like, then why would you... it's not just about it not being true. Because I think using general categories works. It's fine mm. when it's useful. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes it becomes not useful, and that's when you've got a bloody problem, right? Because well, now we've got this unuseful thing that is harming people. And I, so look, I. I am in a Facebook group, or I'm intermittently in a Facebook group, where it's essentially TERFs versus it's, it's TERFs versus TRAs. It's people who don't like trans people um, arguing with people that think that trans people are fine and you should probably just leave them alone for a little bit. Um, and I end up having a lot of conversations. And one of the things I, I genuinely am interested in understanding is how do you how do you define sex though? Like how does how do intersex people fit into your worldview? Okay, well you don't want me to talk about intersex people. What about what about men that have, you know, cis men that have got gynecomastia, right? Where they, they grow breast tissue. Mm. What about, you know, like, okay, what about uh, what about cis women that have polycystic ovaries? And like, what about all of these things? Like, because if you're saying that it's it's strictly the biological stuff, well, okay, what elements of it? Primary and secondary sex characteristics? Secondary sex characteristics are basically changed by hormones, right? Mm. Primary ones can be ambiguous and your chromosomes don't necessarily cleanly, like, you know, it's not mm. a direct line from these chromosomes to this sort of, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, anatomical presentation. It is so much more complex than people let on. And this sort of very categorical thinking just, just makes it so much harder in so many ways. And I mean, 
I'm I'm going to talk for a little bit longer. I'm so sorry, but like talking about species is something I often do to help people understand this because, I, and I was talking to someone the, other, someone the other day about this, and they just they they did not seem to get it. What my point is is that if you look at species, they don't exist, right? Like where does a chicken or like a, you know sort of proto chicken become a chicken? Right. The, the definition that we've got for species is uh, so basically a population that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Right. But like a chicken, a, a proto chicken can probably breed with next generation. And that uh, chicken can then breed with the next generation of chickens and keeps on going down the line through time. But at some point, like two of these individuals are not going to be able to breed to produce fertile offspring. And that doesn't just happen over time. That happens over area. Look up. Um, look up. What is it? Uh, cir- circular sort of Klein species or like circular species. I can't remember the exact mm. name of it. But there's there's a system, there's a scenario wherein you've got sort of overlapping groups of species that can all uh, breed with each other, and they go around in a circle. And then the two adjacent ones can't breed with each other, but they can breed with all of the other adjacent ones. Weird. Yeah, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's like a right? big like giant Venn diagram of. Yeah of like quote unquote species where they're all fertile in some senses with things that are supposedly in the same species but then they're not fertile with things that are supposedly in a different species but that thing they're fertile with is in the same species as that third thing yeah it's like what do you what do you assign as an irregularity like a duck bill platypus and what what do you assign as like oh actually the existence of this should make us reconsider everything we've known before rather than being like well that's just a weird like you've got to have something that proves the rule mm. um, I think you guys are forgetting though oh. it's high school biology oh true oh and do you know my, what my bad you, you've really you've, you've, a perfect <laughs> this is a perfect a perfect place to send a message to anyone who might be a turf or you know mm. uh, gender critical or thinks that you know uh, woman equals adult human female sex and gender are the same thing sex is mutual blah 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 all of that stuff um, okay cool so here is how your worldview is actually harming cis women you know the women that you say that you care the most about um do you not think that maybe uh, these strict categorizations of sex and gender, uh, this idea that uh, sex is absolutely binary and is absolutely based on chromosomes, is absolutely based on X, Y, Z, do you not think that's maybe harmful to people who have polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome, who have to go through, or who are expected to go through all of these treatments and who are treated as being, you know, less than if they don't go through certain treatments? All of them being purely, I guess, sort of, I mean, what's the word, um, surface level. All of them being mm. aesthetic, right? You know, like these gender affirming things like, you know, oh, getting rid of facial hair where we don't think you have facial hair. Mm. Oh, we, maybe we should change your, try and change your body composition because it's not the, none of that like really matters for someone's health. We should be focusing on the more things that relate to their health. But instead we have, you know, young girls being told you need to lose weight. Which is not very, it's not a great thing to be saying to, you know, a kid. And you can see the root of all of this comes from just these strict sex categories and not allowing people to exist outside of the sort of expected presentations of them. I have a question. Go for it. Is PCOS an illness? Um, or like, is it only an illness in that we see it as an illness? Do you- I think, okay, so what I would say is I think there are some signs of it that are not necessarily harmful. Um, but I would say that it generally could be described as an illness based on the aspect of diabetes and how that insulin can be. and yeah. pain. The insulin and pain. Yeah, we don't love that. It's like the DSM five, where like, um, uh, which is I made a joke about at the start of the, po- uh, the start of the podcast, which is a different a different joke about the DSM five that we like to say. But um, the idea that like something's only a problem uh, if it is affecting your life. Mm. So like, but then the the problem with that is if you've found out some really weird, complicated mental like like house of cards you've built to get around the problem, um, then you just don't get diagnosed. Yes, mm. because you've built a world around you that... It's like if you mask too well, yes. yeah, yeah. you don't get diagnosed with autism. You Such don't as kidding. lots of women and young girls. Yeah, I think that, again, it's, it's just stuff like there, there could be a world built for people with PCOS who then wouldn't feel like there's anything that wrong with them. And I also just feel like women who are in pain... Like women, like a lot of women need to have periods. Mm. They're quite painful. Can't we just give them time off work? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of the medication I took and like really strong pain medication I took for PCOS because I was still expected to turn up to work and to school. <laughs> and like if I was just like left alone with a hot water bottle yeah it wouldn't have been something that i'd felt like i'd need to take drugs for yeah we've said that like 50 percent of people don't have um symptoms of this right if you've got it you've you've got a greater than 50 percent chance of not exhibiting really any symptoms which means that like is it is it is it just a, a sort of expression of human variance right of of like sort of genetic i guess um variability 
in some cases it might be, and in other cases it could it, it could be, and then also could have um, these specific issues, you know, the health issues that are attached to it. Out of interest, what does that mean? When you when there are people, 50% of people who don't have any symptoms, what do they? Have they got cysts with no symptoms? Have they got... They would have none of the other symptoms. They would have the androgen. So I, I think it means they would have the androgen stuff. So they've got then, higher levels of hormones, but it's not actually turned into anything. Not showing up. Yeah, that's interesting. So remember that like the symptoms that I've listed off are more than just the diagnostic criteria. So you could meet the diagnostic criteria um, and not necessarily have um, all of these other symptoms like oily, oily skin and acne, weight mm. gain, thinning hair and hair loss, all of those sort of things, right? Okay. So like, if you were to look at your, uh, say, your ovaries and you had uh, lots of, of, of these specific kinds of cysts or you had the sort of um, irregular periods or if you had the higher androgen levels, you could be, you would fall into the diagnostic, you would like fit I into see. the diagnostic criteria, but you wouldn't necessarily need to have sort of apparent symptoms yes right mm. and I guess again what we're what we've kind of been touching on here what I say touching on what we've been like very much saying here is that the way that we view people and how they should be very much affects how we deal with things medically and we medicalize things that might not need to be medicalized as heavily as they are and we take away people's choice based on silly things like expected sex and gender presentation and all of that nonsense. I mean, it's this is very much an interesting, I guess, syndrome to look at. It's very much an interesting thing to look at if you want to consider how does society impact, I guess, medicine in general? How does that impact how we view, you know, presentations of people? Because as we said, as we said kind of up top, it's sort of this intersection of all of these different things that we are just not really very good at dealing with in a sort of nuanced way. But that is kind of it for the show. The one last thing I want to mention is I said up the top that I'd mention um, sort of trans men and uh, polycystic ov ov uh, ovary syndrome in, in them. And we used to think that they had a higher prevalence and then with more studies, it seems that there isn't very much a higher prevalence. So it's not necessarily um, connected uh, too deeply to polycystic ovarian syndrome. I mean, we could do an entire episode on this because there is some really interesting stuff there. But yeah, like, I mean, it, it's it's not necessarily as easy to study as we might have thought because our, our ideas of how it affects people has just changed over time. I have a last question. Go for it. Um, is it called polycystic ovary syndrome because we used to think that the one of the primary thing or the primary thing we would find is polycysts? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Poly meaning many, cysts yeah. being the little bags of fluid. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, that's the same for most things. And then we realized that people can have these other things and and it doesn't have to have the cysts probably yeah i okay. mean and that's when the diagnosis probably would have widened but that's it for this episode there's just one thing left <gasps> it's a quick fire quiz dun oh, no. dun 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 Sweating. are you ready no okay so the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always i'll ask one question that's one question between the two of you the first person to buzz into the correct answer wins what do they win Luke? a little cyst on their ovaries Another just one, one. <laughs> just one because so you don't get polycystic ovary syndrome okay because it's just one yeah maybe you get another one Watch out. And Luke, what is your buzzer? <laughs> Bloop. Lena, what is your buzzer? <laughs> oh, powerful buzzer. Because of the testosterone pumping through my body. My aggressive buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> my question for you both is, what are the three symptoms that characterize polycystic ovarian syndrome? <laughs> Oh, I think Luke got there first. He needs a cyst. He doesn't. I need one. He's an assist. No, I'll, ah! take, I'll take one for the team. Um, you've got enough. So, <laughs> sorry. That's assuming you get That's this right, mate. It's a weird bird. Yeah, yeah, it is a weird bird. Okay, so the three are cysts on your ovaries, multiple, uh, irregular periods, and um, higher than normal levels of androgens. Ding, ding, ding. You are correct. Mm. Here is a lovely little cyst for your ovary. Would you I'll... like to donate one? <laughs> I have some spare. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, look away. So while generous I, of you. Thank I you. <laughs> and now I think it's time, Luke, to thank some of our patrons. Yeah, go on. So, I want to say a big old thank you to Moon. I want to say thank you to Harris Maranakis. I want to say thank you to Adam Alkawaja. Alkawaja. I'm very sorry, Adam. You, you tried. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Sienna. Thank you, MG. Thank you, Matt. Maximilian shoot off. Thanks, all of you legends. Yeah, thank you very much. Shall we probably end the show now, Luke? I would I, I would assume so. Before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thank you to executive producers Danito and Glitch and thank
thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe to new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys. Or you can find a contact us at SciGuys Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. <sighs> Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod! Hell yeah. At gmail.com. <laughs> you can follow me at NotCorey everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cupboard everywhere. You can follow me at Lena Norms. Almost everywhere. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Almost everywhere. And not on TikTok. Oh, Sorry. great. Congratulations. You've resisted the call. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>